If Pete said gross once, he said a hundred times. I tried not taking it personally, after all it was pretty gross. Not to mention humiliating. Especially when Mr. Monroe bathed Howie and me in tomato juice. Chester had managed to escape the skunk's assault, but Mr. Monroe considered giving him a regular bath just to be on the safe side. Knowing how much Chester hates baths, he spelled it out. I think I should give Chester a B-A-T-H-2, he told Mrs. Monroe. To which Chester's response was, I'm out of H-E-R-E, -E, and he was gone. The Monroes haven't figured out that Chester can spell. Cats, in case you don't know it, do not care to be bathed by anything other than their own tongues. Dogs, on the other hand, have an entirely different philosophy of life. Simply stated, it's this. Never do for yourself what you can get others to do for you. I call this conservation of energy. Chester has a less exalted name for it. Laziness, I believe it is. In any event, after our tomato juice baths, Howie and I were plunked into the tub for a nice long soak. Howie got to practice his backstroke, and I got to practice my life-saving skills each time he sank to the bottom. It was after Mr. Monroe had left us swathed in towels to dry off that Chester poked his head around the bathroom door, looked to the left and right, sniffed the air to be sure we no longer stank, and cautiously entered the room. Chester, I said, I'd like a few words with you. All right, all right, he said, so plan A didn't exactly work out. It didn't exactly work out, I repeated. Is that all you have to say for yourself? No, said Chester. I also want to tell you about plan B. I am not normally prone to violence, but at that moment, I might have been tempted to tie Chester's whiskers in a bountiful array of knots had I not been so tightly wrapped in my towel. At the very least, I would have pressed for an apology, but I was beginning to see that there were more similarities between Chester and Pete than I'd ever noticed before. Being a cat or an eleven-year-old boy, I surmised, must mean never having to say you're sorry. Okay, lads, here's what I'm thinking, Chester said as he began to pace in front of us. How he loves it when Chester gets going like this, and he panted appreciatively. I, on the other hand, tried rolling my eyes, but only succeeded in noticing that my bangs needed trimming. Let's say I am right about Benicula's mother, Chester said, which of course I am. My guess is that Benicula hasn't figured out where she is. Maybe he hasn't even made the connection between his mother and the movie theater. Otherwise, he would have broken out of this joint a long time ago. So he's still waiting for her to come to him. Fine, here's what we've got to do. He paused to look at us. Why do I feel like I'm addressing the Roman Senate? He asked. Howie and I looked blankly at each other. Is that a trick question? Howie said. Chester shook his head wearily. Togas, he said. He should have known better than to ask. Oh, I read a book about ancient Rome, Howie piped up enthusiastically. Screaming mummies of the Pharaoh's tomb, flesh crawlers number 28. See, there are these twins, Harry and Callie Fishbein, and they found this time travel machine in their grandfather's attic. They were just fooling around with it, but before you know it, poof, they were in ancient Egypt, Chester snapped, cutting Howie off. They were in ancient Egypt, Howie, and the two of you look like ancient Romans. And believe it or not, there is an actual difference between ancient Egypt and ancient Rome. And why I even bother to bring up historical or literary references with you two dolts is beyond me. Chester kept on ranting, but I'm not sure what else he had to say. Drowsy from my bath in the room's warmth, I nodded off somewhere around historical or literary references. When I regained consciousness, he was carrying on about Plan B. So we gotta keep our eye on him at all times, he was saying, because if he does start making connections, there's no stopping him. Either we have to prevent their reuniting entirely, or, better yet, use Benicula to lead us to his mother. He may still be weak, but even so, I'm going to need your help. Maybe we should work in shifts. <sighs> we have to put on dresses? Howie whined. Chester grimaced. We'll take turns, okay? Oh. Just then, Mr. Monroe came into the room to give us a final rubdown. He looked at us and smiled. Chester, you look like you're addressing the Roman Senate, he said. Uncanny, Chester commented after Mr. Monroe had left. Yes, I said, thinking of yesterday's breakfast. It was nice having fresh meat for a change, wasn't it? Hey, Uncle Harold, Howie said. I get it. Fresh meat. Uncanny. That was pretty good. Thanks, Howie, I said, leaving it at that. It's embarrassing when you make a joke and don't even realize it. The night watch began. Why I was supporting Chester's harebrained scheme, I don't know. Sometimes you just find yourself doing things Chester expects you to do. So I volunteered to take the first shift, figuring it would be better to get it over with and have the rest of the night for uninterrupted sleep. 
What I hadn't counted on was the discovery I would make while I was on duty, one that would keep me awake and alert the whole night. But Nikola was sick, really sick, far weaker than he would be from Chester's depriving him of his carrot juice. He wasn't moving at all. When I talked to him, his ears didn't twitch or stir as they normally did. At times, it seemed he wasn't even breathing. Not wanting to alarm Howie, I let him sleep through his shift. As for Chester, well, I tried to convince him that Benicula was in trouble, but he wasn't having any of it. Either he misses his mother or he's faking, was his unscientifically arrived at diagnosis. Neither one is fatal, Harold, and if it is... Chester! What are you saying? I think you know what I'm saying, Harold. Desperately seeking some way of comprehending Chester's devious mind, I asked, Chester, are you still drinking Benicula's juice? Not all the time, he answered, although I have developed a taste for the stuff. No, I have other ways of foiling his plans now. But Chester, he may be really sick, I said. Harold, once and for all you've got to understand, Benicula is not the Easter Bunny. He's a spinach sucker, the bane of broccoli, a bad rabbit with bad habits. And if he can lead us to his mother, we may be able to put an end to this entire race of terrorizing hares once and for all. But Chester, you said so yourself. He probably hasn't made any connections yet, and he certainly isn't going anywhere. He can barely move. Now how is he going to lead us to his mother when he can't even lift his head? Chester narrowed his eyes to slits. Don't underestimate his vampirical powers. Believe me, Harold, if he can't lead us to his mother, he will somehow manage to bring his mother here to him. You can lead a horse of a different color to water, but it's still a horse. Don't ask. As it turned out, Benicula did go somewhere, but it was not under his own powers, vampirical or otherwise. Unable to stand it any longer, I woke Toby up just before dawn and dragged him by the sleeve of his pajamas downstairs to Benicula's cage. It didn't take him long to get the picture. Mom! Dad! Come quick! He shouted. Benicula's really sick. I think he's going to die. Mr. and Mrs. Monroe raced down the stairs. Mr. Monroe, still half asleep, tumbled over the armchair, which sent Chester flying. Chester's indignant screech in turn woke Howie, who bolted from under the coffee table just in time to get tangled in Mr. Monroe's legs. Nobody, other than Chester, seemed to notice or care, though. All eyes were on Benicula. Oh, Robert! said Mrs. Monroe touching her husband's arm as he opened the cage and lifted the limp languid rabbit from it. I knew we should have taken him to the vet on Saturday. We've waited too long. Mr. Monroe held Benicula close to his chest. His breathing seems normal, if a bit slow, he said, stroking the bunny lovingly. But there's definitely something wrong with him. I'll call Dr. Greenbrier right away and leave a message that I'm bringing Benicula in on my way to work this morning. I'm pretty sure his downtown office is open early on Mondays. Can I go with you, Dad? Toby asked. Mr. Monroe shook his head. You have school today, young man. But I could miss it, couldn't I? What's one day of school? You have tomorrow off because of teacher's conferences. That's enough days off for this week. Besides, it's Benicula who's sick, not you. But what if Benicula di- Toby stopped himself from completing his sentence. I bumped up against his leg to remind him that his pal Harold was there for him. I felt his hand come to rest lightly on top of my head. Now, son, Mr. Monroe said in a soft, soothing voice. I'm sure Benicula will be fine. Maybe there's a problem with the food we've been giving him. Or maybe it's some kind of virus. Whatever it is, Dr. Greenbrier will figure it out and have him all fixed up in no time flat. Promise? Toby said. I looked up at Mr. Monroe's face. There was something in it that told me he wasn't entirely comfortable with his answer. Promise, he told Toby. Later that morning, after Mr. and Mrs. Monroe had gone to work and Toby and Pete to school, the phone rang. Howie jumped up from where he was napping and began running in circles. I'll get it! I'll get it! He yipped. The answering machine picked up. Boys, Mr. Monroe's voice said. Howie stopped yipping at once. I just wanted to leave you this message since I know you'll get home before I do today. Dr. Greenbrier is keeping Benicula overnight. He needs to run some tests. The important thing is to not worry. Benicula will be fine, guys, okay? Benicula will be... fine. The machine clicked off. Mr. Moreau didn't sound like Benicula would be fine, Howie said. No, he didn't, I agreed. Chester said nothing, and the three of us fell into an uneasy silence. The only sound was the ticking of the grandfather clock in the hall. The space by the window where Benicula's cage had been sitting only that morning was empty, save for the fine layer of dust that held a few white and black hairs. I sniffed at them, sneezed from the dust, then felt my eyes grow wet with the thought that these few hairs were all that remained of Benicula. I'd never even said goodbye. I turned. Chester was staring intently at the empty space. Plan C, he said, and then fell silent again.